Hello, everyone. Welcome to the presentation of the paper called Netcracker, a peek into the routing architecture of Xilinx 7 series FPGAs. I am Irina Stilovic from EPFL. Novel applications have triggered significant changes at the system level of FPGA architecture design, such as the introduction of embedded VLW processor arrays and hardened NOCs. And even though the routing architecture of the soft logic fabric has largely remained unchanged, it too will have to evolve to keep up with these developments and technology scaling. Academic research can, of course, contribute in this development, for instance, by providing systematic analysis of design trade-offs. But for it to happen, we first need to understand the existing routing architectures. And that is where Netcracker comes in. It enables the analysis of highly complex routing architectures, which in turn facilitates general understanding and helps identifying timely research problems and fostering future research. Our contributions in this work are twofold. First, we develop Netcracker, and second, we showcase its capabilities by using it to analyze the routing network of a representative device of Xilinx 7 series family. We discuss possible reasons behind the design choices, and we contrast the obtained results with both common knowledge and the typical assumptions in academia. The presentation will be organized as follows. First, I will give a brief description of the architecture and implementation of Netcracker. And then I will present some of the results that we have given in the paper, focusing on switch box diversity, routing channel composition and width, and the adjacency analysis concerning wires and CLBs. After that, I will conclude the talk. Netcracker is a vendor agnostic Python tool for the analysis of FPGA routing architectures, which we have made openly available. At its input, Netcracker expects a file in JSON format, which describes one or more switch boxes of an FPGA routing fabric. The data to create such an input file is often readily available in FPGA design tools. Internally, Netcracker organizes its analysis in a number of passes having each path being as atomic as possible and able to produce and consume the results of other passes allows to organize them in a dependency graph so that when the analysis request is specified by the user, Netcracker can schedule the required set of passes and produce artifacts as data or images. Netcracker comes with a number of built-in passes, only some of which are highlighted here and will be discussed later. Here comes our first set of analysis, which we name switch box diversity. But before continuing, I need to give you some Xilinx terminology. Routing switches, as we know them, are called programmable interconnect points or simply PIPs. Routing multiplexers are then a collection of PIPs that drive a signal. A switch box is a collection of routing multiplexers and the points of entry to a switch box or exit from a switch box are called PIP junctions. If we take a graph view of a switch box, then the nodes become these PIP junctions and the edges are programmable connections between them. Switch box diversity analysis essentially does comparison of switch boxes by their internal connectivity. And this can be done across a sub-region of the FPGA or an entire FPGA fabric. We run this analysis on a relatively small member of the seven series family, and we plot the results here. We have two images. On the left, the results when the connections to longs are excluded, and on the right, when these connections are included as well. Note that one color corresponds to one unique switch box, and that the yellow color corresponds to the most numerous switch boxes, which are those that interface the CLBs. So if we focus on the left part, we see that there is vertical uniformity, which is not a surprise given the column-oriented architecture. But for instance, we do not see wire-length dependent periodic patterns, which we have in the past observed when analyzing Stratix 4 architecture um, description that comes with the VTR. On the right, we see diversity of switch boxes towards the edges, which is uh, we trust because long wires are reaching the edges of the device. So finally, perhaps the most interesting to note and most important to note is that SBs that interface CLBs are most often identical. 
Our second set of analysis targets routing channel composition and width. To analyze routing channels, NetCracker expects a description of one representative switch box, which we highlight here in yellow. Then it identifies all the connections that emanate from it, along with the coordinates of the destination switch boxes. In Vivado, the PIP junctions that are connected to routing wires conveniently carry the name of the corresponding wire. And not only that, the wire names themselves hold the information of their direction, such as north, east, south, or west, and the length of the wire. So, for example, PIP junctions that are named E1 BEG and E1 END would be at the two extreme ends of the wire named E1, which is heading east and terminating at a switch box one column away. As it turns out, not all wires are cardinal. There are also non-cardinal or diagonal wires. But more interestingly, some wires have a secondary destination, which we mark here as this short green stub. The wire length of both cardinal and non-cardinal wires is equivalent to the total number of rows and columns of the switch boxes that they span. For our analysis, we cluster the wires into three sets based on their wire length, short range being wires of length 1, mid range being wires of length 2, 4 and 6, and long wires being those of length 12 and 18. Let us now look at how many short wires emanate from a representative switch box. At first, we instruct NetCracker to infer the wire destination from their name, and this graph shows the obtained results. On the X and Y axis, we have the offset between the destination and the source switch box, while the value that are inside the squares correspond to the number of length one wires that terminate at that particular location. So we see a perfectly symmetrical pattern of eight length one wires in all cardinal directions, and this number is relatively high. If, however, we instruct NetCracker to infer the wire destination from the input graph and not the wire name, then we obtain the plot on the right. In this plot, the regularity is slightly broken because some of the length one wires have a secondary destination and some even terminate at diagonal switch boxes. Perhaps not immediately visible, there is also a reduced number of connections ending in vertically adjacent switch boxes. And we found that this is due to two special PIP junctions, which instead of driving a length one wire, as the name would suggest, serve only to reroute signals between local PIP junctions. Let us now turn to mid-range connections. On the left, we see where cardinal connections terminate and on the right, where the diagonal ones terminate. We notice that there is no directional bias in terms of wire counts, which goes in hand with the previous academic conclusions. Interestingly, the vertical span is higher than horizontal, which could suggest that the seal bit tile width exceeds its height. We can also notice here that the stubs are always very close to the primary destination and without exception terminate in the vertically neighboring switch boxes. Now this could suggest two things. First, that the primary and the secondary endpoints share the same signal via. And the second, that the capacitive load of the stub is quite low, which would allow the corresponding wires to cover a net with a fan out of two at a very low cost. Seven series FPGAs also contain long wires of length 12 and 18. What is interesting about them is that they appear to be bidirectional. Now, this may not be too surprising as a similar shift from unidirectional to bidirectional long wires has already been reported for Intel ARIA 10 devices. The longs are also an exception in terms of these intermediate taps because apart from the vertical length 20 wires, which have no taps, Others have one tap precisely midway. Once all emanating wires are identified, NetCracker can compute the channel width, and it does so by computing a sum of products of wire lengths in X, respectively Y direction, and the corresponding number of wires. And this table here summarizes the values that we have obtained. The final type of analysis I will tell you about is what we call the adjacency analysis.
Its primary focus is on the connectivity internal to the switch box, but it can easily be extended to the connectivity between wires and CLBs, as I will show you a little later. To perform adjacency analysis, Netcracker expects, again, a description of one representative switch box, here shown as a graph where nodes are PIP junctions of that switch box, and the edges are programmable connections between them. Then, instead of analyzing the wires that emanate from the switch box, Netcracker focuses on simplifying this graph representation to facilitate general understanding. This simplification is done through clustering of nodes and edges. For example, on the top right figure, we see how two groups of nodes in red and blue are reduced to two nodes only, and the set of edges between them is reduced to one single edge. And the bottom right, we see the equivalent and uh, possibly more friendly visualization of the clustering results. It is an adjacency heat map. In this map, the groups of nodes become equivalent to an entire row or an entire column, while the color of the cell at their intersection corresponds to the number of connections there are between these two groups of nodes. In what follows, I will use this visual representation of a heat map for the results of the adjacency analysis. But before that, let us understand how Netcracker clusters PIP junctions. First, it can apply what we call name clustering. An example of that is shown on the left. We have output PIP junctions that drive a length one wire going west, and they are grouped together. The resulting cluster inherits the name, which is W1, and is assigned the size 4. And the same principle is applied on the input PIP junctions. But to account for non-cardinal wires and to account for those that have a secondary destination, clustering by direction vector is more suitable. And an example of that clustering is shown on the right. We have PIP junctions here that are the ends of a length two wire heading southwest. And these PIP junctions are grouped into clusters of size four, whose name now uniquely defines the offset of the destination PIP junction with respect to the source. So let us now look at the results of the wire-to-wire -wire adjacency analysis, which is applied on short and mid-range wires. We see a heat map where the rows will be the clusters of input PIP junctions and the columns will be the clusters of output PIP junctions. The cluster size will always be given in the square brackets. Here, the black color means complete absence of connections between two clusters, while red means that there is the maximum number of connections found, which is in our case 16. The diagonal of this adjacency heat map concerns the connections between wires of the same length and the same type. And if we look at it carefully, we will note the complete absence of fully backward connections, which kind of makes sense. This column of the adjacency heat map concerns connections between mid-range wires and length one wires. And clearly, we see that the mid-range wires drive length one wires in all directions, including backwards. And not only that, the cardinal mid-range wires drive twice more length one wires that head in the exact same direction. We have here the full adjacency heat map produced by Netcracker. First, we have to notice this remarkably regular connectivity patterns. Then we can also see that uh, length one wires do not drive wires of length four and six. We find that cardinal mid-range wires do not drive wires of length two, which return to the half plane of the source. And perhaps the most interesting is the fact that the number of wires that each wire can drive, which here is easy to compute because it is the sum of the entries in one row, vastly surpasses three. And three is the value that we commonly assume in academia. Now, these results were all produced using name clustering. If we instruct Netcracker to use direction vector clustering, then the real connectivity patterns will emerge. They are not necessarily identical, but most of the regularity is retained. And part of it is, of course, lost on providing the connections to secondary destinations. Now let's turn to the adjacency analysis that concerns long wires. The heat map on the left here focuses on the longs as outputs of the switch box, while the heat map on the bottom focuses on the longs as inputs to the switch box. We can notice that cardinal length two wires do not drive any longs. 
We also see that each long drives one length four and one length six wire, but does not drive any of the shorter wires. And there is also one detail that we found interesting to note here is that the vertical length 12 wires do not drive other types of longs. And knowing that these vertical wires are the ones that do not have the middle tap, they could possibly be the fastest option for long distance vertical communication. The adjacency analysis can easily be extended to connections between wires and CLBs, as many of the switch box PIP junctions that are directly connected to CLB inputs and outputs. But before seeing the analysis results, let us quickly remember the internals of a CLB in a seven series FPGA. The basic building block is called the logic element. And for what follows, it's important to note that it has a six input LUT with inputs named A1 to A6, one registered output named AQ and two combinational outputs named A and A mux. Four such logic elements, A, B, C, and D, form a slice. And two slices, which we name U and T, form one configurable logic block. The most interesting connectivity patterns we observed in the adjacency heat maps are summarized here. We found that all LUT inputs are driven directly from global routing and that there is no reduction of input bandwidth typical of academic and Intel architectures. We also saw that each LUT input can be driven by one length two and two length one wires from all directions, which goes in hand with previous studies. And we found that there is an indirect possibility of length four and six wires driving LUT inputs, and this possibility is given by the two same special PIP junctions that instead of driving length one wires, as their name would suggest, reroute signals between local PIP junctions. Concerning CLB outputs, they drive one mid-range and two short-range wires of each type. And there too, there is an indirect possibility for them to send signal on length 18 vertical wires. And this possibility, again, is provided by these two same PIP junctions. Here too, direction vector clustering breaks this regularity to some extent. Finally, we thought important to analyze the CLB feedback connections. In this heat map, the rows are CLB outputs and the columns are LUT inputs. There are eight equivalence classes. In each driver class, note that the logic element outputs originate from different logic elements. Additionally, combinational outputs come from the same slice, while registered output comes from another slice. Now, this could reflect the physical distance of the driven wires from the actual location of the drivers, and the fact that the registered output is probably more likely to tolerate higher delays. We found a few interesting patterns here, one of them being that each six input LUT can reach all LUTs in the entire CLB, either directly or via the multiplexer of the logic element. And with that, I'm arriving to the conclusion of this talk. We have presented NetCracker, a flexible framework for extracting the characteristics of FPGA routing architectures. It is easy to extend it with new analysis and we made it openly available. We showcased NetCracker by performing the analysis on previously unexplored seven series architecture family of Xilinx. We looked at switch box diversity, routing channel composition and width, and a number of adjacency analysis. But there are more of these analyses in the paper and I invite you to, to take a look at them. The main premise on which this work was based is that understanding existing routing architectures is necessary for providing the right basis for innovation. In this paper, we have raised a number of potentially interesting research questions. For example, how much a routing architecture can benefit from occasionally present secondary destinations, from the absence of uniform intermediate tabs, which are commonly assumed in academic research from long wires without any intermediate taps, from second and high level multiplexing in switch boxes and some dedicated connections between the vertically adjacent switch boxes. And if LUTs have balanced input delay profile, which our analysis seem to suggest, then the premise that entered the design of programmable interconnections should probably change. We also found that layout efficiency might be of prime importance. So for instance, transistor count may matter less than actual delay penalty. And a routing architecture could be tailored towards a particular efficient multiplexer size. But there is more to that. I invite you to read the paper and I thank you for having watched this presentation.